All right. So just by a show of hands, how many of the surgeons here have used navigation in their practice? OK, so everyone's pretty much familiar with it. And which systems are you using? Body Tom, the 3D C arm, the O arm, or Brain Lab? So mostly the 3D C arm. OK. By a significant amount. All right, so principles of navigation are basically, and Rock mentioned some of these already, were to optimize workflow, reduce radiation exposure, improve accuracy, and then mitigate the limits of fluoroscopy. So, and this is cases like complex deformities or unusual anatomy or, you know, as in the case of Cleveland, we have patients with larger body mass indices, so patients who are difficult to visualize on x-ray. Potential benefits of, ac of navigation include increased accuracy, decreased radiation, you can pre-plan your screw size and trajectory. You can reduce your OR time. Now, granted, that's with a caveat because there is a learning curve to begin with. And you can facilitate minimally invasive approaches, perform highly technical complex cases, and visualize instruments in multiple orientations simultaneously. So in patients with rotational deformities or scoliotic deformities, navigation can be very helpful. So some of this was already mentioned earlier. This is just showing some of the benefits of of a minimally invasive approach, and that we're all familiar with the Wiltsey approach and the benefits of MIS, perk screws versus the open approach. So some of the disadvantages of the percutaneous approach is that if your patient has some difficult anatomy, then you're actually going to maybe take some more fluoro shots. You're going to depend on fluoro more because you're relying on your fluoro to place your screws, and in the patients who are osteoporotic or obese, you're going to have difficulty visualizing things. So in terms of what are the components, the components are the imaging. And for me, what I do is I obtain a pre-op volumetric CT scan, and I'll fuse that to an intra-op spin. The computer in the workstation, the camera, the trackers, and then the reference points. So in terms of imaging, imaging is getting better. Anyone here remember Floronav? <laughs> not really. OK. So no, not even a show of hand. So 3 operative. 3D intraoperative imaging is now becoming standard. And you can fuse more than just a preoperative volumetric CT. You can use a CT angiogram. You can use an MRI, MRA, functional MRI, or even a PET scan. So you're not limited to just one imaging modality. The workstation and software, this has also improved markedly over time. If you guys uh, come into the lab, you can see some of you have already experienced the pre-planning of the screws. It's very easy, very intuitive to use. You can just add a screw, drag it over to where you want it, rotate it, determine your length and your trajectory. The software, and you can see from some of the 3D recons here, they're, they're very sophisticated. It allows you to map different segments. It allows you to correct for deformity corrections. And you can color code different screws so that you can tell your assistant, OK, I want to target the right L5 screw. I can target the left L5 screw. And you can work accordingly. So in terms of the camera, there are advantages versus the active versus the passive camera. The active camera, there's optical localizing technology. And it exchanges signals with the trackers about 40 times per second. So you can literally take your navigated jam sheet and drag it along the skin, and you're going to get real-time imaging as to where that is. Now, in terms of positioning how the room is set up, you can either position the camera at the foot of the bed or at the head of the bed. For me, what I tend to do is I like the camera at the foot of the bed, and I use just the C-arm, the single C-arm, and I position that on the opposite side of where I'm working. The tracker setup. And we're going to talk about the spine mask as well, but if you're using the shans pins, the tracker should be positioned as close as possible to the level that you're working. And then you want to take the tracker and lay it down flat so that when you do your spin, the tracker's not in your way. Now, the spine mask is really designed to optimize MIS surgery through a non-invasive patient tracking system with really good accuracy. So I've used both systems and in comparing the accuracy, I have noticed no difference. And the benefit of this is that I don't have to worry about shan spins because, as I said, a lot of my patients are obese. Sometimes putting in the shan spins are not as easy as it should be because, as you can imagine, the longer distance between the PSIS and the surface of the skin in someone who's, say, 350 pounds, you're going to get a little bit of a wiggle. The shan spins can pull out. You may not be able to visualize on floor where they're going. So with the spine mask, you can just lay it down on the skin and then get your spin. So it's not in the way. It's easy to apply either before I prep or after I prep. And it's very accurate. There's 31 fiducials versus the typical four-star fiducial. And the system can calculate even if multiple fiducials are blocked at a given time. 
Next step is basically we can calibrate instruments. And the benefit of the navigation system with the spine message is you can calibrate and navigate really anything. And there are pre-calibrated tools, or you can just calibrate on the fly. And the instrument trackers are LED-based. They're uninterrupted by vibration, impaction, or if they're covered in body tissue. So fourth step is basically to initiate the 3D scan. And how we do it is that we drape the patient, we cover the tracker, we get an AP image to make sure that we're looking at the area that we're working, swing it over to a lateral to make sure that we're also in the lateral, we're covering the area that we're of interest, and then we initiate our spin so that we make sure that the machine is able to rotate freely around the patient without any obstruction. The spin on average takes about maybe two minutes. And during that time, everyone steps out of the room so no one's exposed to that extra radiation. This is the picture just showing the registration. So we're taking that spin that we do intraop and fusing it to our preoperative volumetric CT scan. And what the computer does is it allows you to take the green image, which is the 3D spin that you had in the OR, and you line it up as best possible to your volumetric CT, and then you can just hit automatic correlation. The average time that I've noticed that it takes for the computer to do this is about 19 seconds. So once this is done, you can see here that the red image represents the planned screw trajectory. The green image actually is the jam sheet that we're navigating, and we're just following the same trajectory in our pre-planned trajectory. And there's another picture demonstrating that. So you can see here in this patient, this patient had very narrow pedicles. So accessing these pedicles without navigation would have been, at least in my hands, pretty difficult. So navigation was very, very helpful to get pedicle screws at this level. I think these were uh, four or five screws. And here's another picture of that. So in terms of tips and pearls from navigation, you have to trust your instincts. For me, if the navigation doesn't seem right, I'll check an AP image. I'll check a lateral image. Don't hesitate to repeat the spin if you need to. That can also be helpful. In the first few cases, you maybe want to avoid patients who are morbidly obese or patients with complex anatomy. Navigation in the beginning will slow you down, but until you and the entire OR team gets used to it, it's still a useful skill to have. And after about the second or third case, you'll find that it's not adding too much time at all. And in the end, it will save you radiation exposure, and it will save you time, especially in your difficult cases. So in conclusion, knowledge of the surgical anatomy and technique will always be key. Use your judgment. Image guidance benefits are well documented in the literature. There is a learning curve in the beginning, but it's a very useful and important supplement to our OR skills and to our knowledge and experience. Mm -hmm.